Hi, welcome to Roots to the Bone, the channel dedicated purely to ska and reggae trombone. And my guest this week, I am delighted to say, is Mr. Buford O'Sullivan, who started out originally in the third wave of ska in the US, playing with the Toasters and Scofflaws. Um, he has played with the likes of Anti Ballas, Afro Funk Orchestra, Lee Perry, Dave Hilliard and the Rocksteady Seven, Brooklyn Attractors, New York City Scar Orchestra, Dub is a Weapon, and he's also been a long standing member of Easy Star All Stars. And I guess that means you played on Dub Side of the Moon, right? I did not play on Dub Side of the Moon. That, okay. that record came out. When I when I was kind of like in a in a period of inactivity and I saw that thing come out, I was like, wait a minute, I know all those guys. Yeah. But but um, no, Mike Wagner was the trombone player on that. Um, he was a friend of Michael G's, and they they were all kind of like NYU friends who made that record. They kind of all knew each other from like a kind of a scene they were in that I was periphery to because they they were pretty much hardcore reggae, and I was more like ska music. And 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 at the time, I I was it was after this off laws and I was kind of in between things so lucky for me they called me right after they they released that record because Mike Wagner could not go on the road he was he's orthodox Jewish couldn't play Friday night Saturday during the day and um so lucky for me I'm just heathen <laughs> <laughs> so I'll play anytime anywhere so um they called me and so I went on the road with them for some of their first tours and then so I'm on all the all the subsequent records off that okay and yeah. um, so what was the band that introduced you to Scar and you know what was can you remember that moment how you your oh yeah, yeah. life changed and you became you know you got swept up mm -hmm. um seriously I was ready to quit the trombone I was like I think I was 18 and um a friend of mine from from Italy had a mixtape of all of them specials madness you know, Bad Manners, Selector, all of the, all of the British stuff with Scatolites, um, with old, like Ball of Fire was on, uh, was mixed on the tape. And I heard that and I heard trombone all over it. I was like, wait a minute, there's horns on this. There's trombone. Who is that trombone player? And so specials, Rico Rodriguez, you know, he's the first one I kind of became aware of. And then, um, and then as I went through that tape, I learned a little bit more about it and then heard about Don Drummond from the Scatolites and noticed that kind of both those players had a, had a phrasing that really appealed to me. You know, whereas a lot of jazz and trump trombone players are technique based and as fast as you can arpeggiate and, and chromatics and, and do all of that stuff, these guys were playing really simple phrases that I, my, my head got right away. And I understood what they were saying, basically. And so I began to cop some of those licks. <laughs> and I uh, joined a band that was kind of more of a new wave band. Um, but we did Nightclub and we did Ball of Fire and a couple of originals on, in the ska vein, along with some of the, some of the, the maybe post-punk big beat sounds that were coming around at that time. And so it just kind of always followed me. And uh, when that band, that band was called Big Noise. And I remember when that band broke up, I went to New York and one of the periods where I was kind of looking for gigs, didn't have much going on, moved in with a roommate. He happened to have the first specials record. I was like, oh, I haven't listened to this in a couple of years, put it on. I was like, oh yeah, that's why, you know? And um, I, I would run into the toasters and need, this was late eighties. And so I'd run into the toasters at various shows and see them play. They had the Unity Two singers at the time, and I forgot her name. There, there was a there was a woman playing trombone for the Toasters at the time. I, I, shoot me, I can't remember her name. Um, and then I ran into Mike Trance and Richard and Richard Brooks on the street in New York. They and I was carrying my trombone. I was going to a jam session. I said, "Hey, you, you like ska music?" I was like, "Yeah, sure." And they said, "Come out to Huntington. 
we got a rehearsal and a gig for you. And so I did, I took the train, which is kind of, in London, it's kind of like going down to Brighton. It's kind of about the same distance. Mm -hmm. So I took the train out to Huntington, Long Island, practiced with them, they liked it. I did a show with them out there and I, I stayed with that band for over 10 years <laughs> playing it. And at the same time, the Toasters um, were pretty much professional outfit touring, Europe tours and state tours. And they needed a sub trombone player for Eric Storkman. So I did that, so I began subbing. And so at that point, I kind of just learned kind of what was happening, like 1990, 1991, like all these bands like, you know, New York Citizens and Urban Blight. And in Boston, there was Bim Scala Bim, you know, and- uh, We Bim were Scala all Bim. oblivious to that in the UK. Like, uh, you know, it was, so at that point, Ska had kind of really fizzled out mostly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the two -tone thing, three. You know, by the early eighties, it fizzled out. And then there yeah. was this slight revival in the late eighties with Gaz, Males and the Trojans, Maroon Town, Potato Five, Forest Hillbillies. Right. But it was very sort of, it was quite underground. It wasn't an explosion in the same way as Two Tone had been. Yeah. I don't think we were really aware. I, I certainly wasn't that there was anything happening in America at that point in time. Mm -hmm. It was pretty urban. It was mixed with kind of the late eighties, early nineties, urban beats and urban vibe urban blight you know um you know the skies were all orange at night you know because of the lamp lights and there was there was there was a crack epidemic that was that was beginning to come down a little bit but still causing a lot of urban decay and so a lot of the bands had that messaging really you know and and, and bucket you know coming from england having seen the first part of it kind of brought his very intelligent political sensibilities about it you know at the same time, he was kind of a rough boy himself. So, you know, he's, you know, this he's playing some sweaty punk rock. Is this who founded Moonscar Records? Yeah, Bucket, Rob Hingley. Yeah, yeah he's Devin, he's from Devon. Mm -hmm. And um, moved to New York in the 80s. And uh, he's a enterprising soul. So he was, he was managing the Forbidden Planet science fiction store on Broadway in New York. At the same time, he had the, the toasters. And so, um, you know, so he, he was really out and about on the scene. See, he's not really, I mean, unless you're, you know, you follow Scar, I don't think most people know that a Brit went and kind of really activated Scar in the States and, you know- In New York. Made, in, in, in New York and started- Yeah, yeah. Uh, meanwhile on the West Coast, you know, you know, there were bands doing it too. There was, you know, you know, um, you know there was a scene brewing in, in Southern California. It's pretty famous. Mm -hmm. And that, that, that got more traction. I mean, that's why all the New York fans kind of got some play is because yeah. California, really. And but that's not to say that New York fans didn't have, any, didn't have any action. I mean, I mean, the Toasters were a strong band, you know. But at that point in time, early 90s, when did the kind of the roots vibe of, and the jazz vibe of ska kind of come in? Because I know there was a lot of punk ska and sort of two tone mm -hmm. influenced ska. At what point did people like you start going, oh, right, we can actually, you know, play the deep stuff. We can, you know, bring in the, the roots of the sound. I want to say, I mean, it was the Scofflaws were one of the first that I knew of, you know, as, I was, as my awareness was expanding. Because that was a horn-fronted a horn band. They had Barry, tr tenor track, sax, alto sax and trombone. Um, so they would do a lot of maybe James Brown songs, but Mike Drance was a rude boy and really liked the Scatolites. And so he began to introduce some traditional Scatolites cover songs, which I knew too, you know. Um, and, and Richard Brooks, who's kind of the front man of the band, is more of like a bohemian kind of like wild man who would do anything. Like he liked Frank Zappa, he liked, you know, you know, like like movie theme songs and stuff like that, but he he totally understood the, the this traditional ska. So, ska Floss started doing it. I mean, I think there were other bands trying to do it then, but I think the big surge was when Hepcat came out mm -hmm. with um with their with um with, with their first release. And I remember being at a show in Long Island with ska Floss in the back behind the club, there was always kind of like a tailgate party where people would park their cars and smoke weed and drink beer and hang out in between sets. And um, I saw Victor Rice, Mike Trance, um, a couple of other people standing by a car listening to, the, to this really old school sounding, really well-produced, you know, 
roots ska hepcat i was like what what's this oh my god and they, they were proud they were like yes this is the this, this is where the soul comes in and they're right <laughs> yeah. and how important for you um were the scatolites and, and you know and their reformation in the and touring in the 90s and you know what as a trombone player um what was their impact on you oh i, I first saw them play live um, down by the financial center um 90 maybe 89 88 um and clark gayton was playing trombone kerry brown was on keyboards tommy uh, roland um and and lloyd and lloyd brevet and and those guys are still alive nibs um devin james was playing guitar i think and um so that's the first time i saw clark gayton play who is the undisputed king of New York trombone, ska, and otherwise for the past 20 years, right? Um, and so I saw him play and I was totally impressed because he's a, he's a very smooth, very jazz capable, um, polished, looks good, you know, you know, trombone player. He went on to play with Sting and Bruce Springsteen and, and you know, kind of, he kind of, I want to say he's one of the biggest trombone players in New York beat myself <laughs> but um but i'd see other trombone players came to come through the scatolites the more i saw them like this guy josh roseman was playing he was also part of like um, the groove collective in new york and so they would come through and i'd see them with the next hot shot trombone player who challenged me because you know i've never really been a jazz player per se I'm not a bebop trombone player i i liked you know rico rodriguez's phrasing still you know i liked don drummond's phrasing you know this the, you know you know, so what did you so these, specifically these like out. about Rico? Well, well, Don Drummond particularly as well. Um, what what is it about their phrasing and their their playing? Don's playing. No, it's like oh yes, please. <laughs> you know, it's like really like easy going, slow, hot in the sunshine laid back you know it's not going to you know you know the guy isn't going to arrive on time it's going to be laid back i mean i kind of always kind of saw that in those guys phrases both of them really you know you know i, I think probably because you know don drummond was older right and rico was a, was a kid and so rico kind of learned from don drummond and so they both kind of had that that, that similar freight vin gordon does it too you know it's it, maybe it's a caribbean sound a trombone playing where like it's just kind of lazy I and mean, you, you, if you listen to maybe mighty sparrow you kind of hear that on, on those in, the, in that music as well you know just like they're not they're not going too fast and i like that and what is it about don's playing that you know it really gets under your skin doesn't it there's something there that you know because obviously he had a lot going on with his own with his mental health he did he did and, um, yeah. There's something in his playing that is kind of like, I, do, I guess the word is melancholic, mm. but joyful as well, which is, I guess that describes the blues, you know, it's mm. up, upbeat and downbeat at the same time. Yeah. Uh, yeah. How, how can trombone players strive to, to reach that? What is that even? Well, I, I, well, this melodical playing really for me where it hits me is when they're playing melodies you know when a trombone player starts getting really technical and you know he went to conservatory and he's amazing he's on fire and like like yeah yeah dude i mean it sounds great when rico rodriguez plays you know on ghost town it's behind the beat it's stretched back and it is sad and it is mournful and it's lyrical and it's bluesy because you know, those guys maybe didn't have the easiest of lives. And so maybe, you know, Drummond's conflict inside probably came out in his playing in a dark way in some of the musical choices. And people know for sure that life isn't all happy, happy, happy. It isn't all hero worship, you know? It, you know, it isn't all technique. It isn't all, you know, showing off. It's singing something, which those two guys did, you know? Like Jack Teagarden did the same thing with 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 Lou, with, um, with Armstrong, you know, like not you know, right? It's ba 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 ba, really easy going, and the way he sang was easy going, and people like easy going, 
people, people, you know, I mean, especially now, times of war and plague, right? People are going to want to hear, um, we'll meet again. Don't know how, don't know when sometime. You know, they want to just hear a simple melody, just like, you know, take them away. And, you know, I don't know, maybe, you know, newly independent Jamaica had some stress that people wanted to not feel. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know? Just, just London, getting back to that um, yeah. Ghost Town solo, um, when I, I went to the Rico's sort of farewell after he'd passed away, there was a, at the Hootenanny in Brixton, there was a special event which Jerry Dammers hosted, uh, which uh, Vin Gordon played. And, and um, Jerry Dammers said that the 12 inch version of Ghost Town, the trombone solo on that, he felt was the pinnacle of all the music that the specials produced was wow, that yeah. trombone solo of Rico's. Wow. And, and I've asked Rico really about it as well. I, yeah. uh, I actually once, well, I interviewed Rico and he asked if he would, if I, I asked if he would play it for me and he refused. He said, no, because you can't, his, his answer was something along the lines of, you can't replicate a mystical moment. You can't replicate Good point. it. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. Anyway. And London all London bombed out. Um, you know, I guess that, that was about the time the Falklands or maybe before the Falklands, right? You know, Same again, yeah, before a little bit before, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Like like a couple of years. There before. was real there was real sadness, there was real darkness, like real darkness on the street. Yeah. You know, and I remember so, it. I was just about, you know, 10, 11, 12. 11 uh, and yeah it was it was a dark time yeah. and then and, and it was an explosion of, of music the two-tone thing mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. wow yeah. yeah so i mean yeah yeah I, I was gonna say that i think that's that's why those guys reach people and those solos reach people i mean even if you're not in ska scene you know that melody is gonna get you because you know it's mm. it, it, it's not it has a lot of different layers and reasons to be yeah yeah. Okay, well, just to wrap up, um, I'd like to ask you um, something that I'm asking everyone who's going to come on here. If you have a couple of tunes, I'm building up a Spotify playlist um, of ska and reggae trombone tunes. So uh, mm -hmm. do you have a couple that you'd like to add to the playlist? Well, one of my favorite ones is Heavenless. I don't know if you have that on the playlist. It's already on there. In fact, we've got two okay. versions, two versions okay. of it. On there. What, the, the original and an Scarface? update. What about mm -hmm. Scarface? You have Scarface on there? Scarface. Um, yeah, that, that, that comes up on, on Rico playlist. It's, it's real good. It's, it, it's, 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 a, it's a rocking one, Scarface. Scarf I don't know that tune. Oh, what era of Rico is it? I don't know. It's, it, it's on a Palmer compilation, I think. Okay, so it would be like a sort of early reggae Rico. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I'll probably and have that another somewhere. one that's. that's Another one from, from a different is, you know, I mentioned Bim Scala Bim. You know, you know, my favorite trombone players are maybe those that maybe have more of a personality and have an original statement. I always felt Vinny Nobile had that. Like Vinny Nobile had a phrasing that other trombone players tried to emulate, you know, like, like so I would say a Good Dog Ska by Bim Scala Bim. Okay. That's a, that's a good one. And I think that's really early, if it's fourth wave, it's early fourth wave, it's maybe 1990. And, uh, and that really has some good, so, some, some real, again, he's not playing jazz bebop licks, he's playing melody and melodic playing. Uh, that's always inspired me. Okay, well, Buford O'Sullivan, thank you so much for coming on Roots to the Boat. It's been an absolute yes, pleasure sir. talking to you. And uh, please, if, you've, if you're watching this, don't forget to subscribe to the channel and keep an eye out for the next interview. Thank you.